Thank you, Pastor Jeff and the worship team for leading us today. And, and thank you, Church of the Mill, for all that you're doing to make the name of Jesus known, uh, not only in Moore in the Spartanburg area, but across this state. And I'm here today because Church of the Mill and Pastor DJ also understands the need to make Jesus known among the nations. I have the privilege of uh, working with uh, your missionaries who are serving all over the world, more than 3,600 of them, and there are 2,700 kids uh, who are uh, sharing the good news of Jesus uh, because as an extension of church at the meal, we know that the gospel must make it to every nation. I'm so grateful for your support of them and thankful for all that God is doing through them in these days. Uh, indeed, it has been difficult as mission teams were more focused locally, as we've seen in the videos this morning, than being able to go globally. Uh, and yet, you continue to send and continue to have a great witness among the nations that uh, I'll be able to share some highlights uh, with about you today. Uh, I agree with you, Pastor DJ, that that uh, before the next pandemic comes, I hope Jesus comes. Uh, it has been a, a challenging time for uh, all of us, for churches, and, and, and certainly for our overseas workers. Uh, and yet, uh, thinking about his coming today, I'm wondering why he has left us here. Uh, do you believe heaven is going to be better than earth? I agree with you. I believe heaven's going to be better than earth. As great as the worship team has done this morning, leading us to the very throne of God, I think worship in heaven will be better than earth. I think everything is going to be better in heaven than on earth. Uh, there are no pandemics in heaven. Uh, there are no presidential elections in heaven. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> uh, there's no cancer in heaven. There's no depression in heaven. There's no addiction in heaven. There's no death in heaven. Heaven? Well, it's heaven. Which brings me to another question. If heaven is all that the Bible says it will be, and the Bible is true, so it is, why has God left us here? <laughs> why doesn't he just save us and take us from the baptistry into heaven? The answer to that question is that heaven is not yet what heaven will be. And that's the reason God has left his church on earth. What will heaven be? We actually have uh, insight into that. In fact, we're able to see in Scripture heaven as it will someday be through a vision that God gave to his servant whose name was John. In the book of Revelation, chapter 7, we find a description of what John saw in a vision of heaven. Not heaven as it was in his day, not heaven as it is in our day, but heaven as it will someday be. I want to turn your attention to Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Uh, listen to what John describes. John says, after this I looked... And behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What an amazing sight it must have been for John from his prison cell to see heaven as it will someday be. I think from John's vision, the vision that God through his word has given to us, we learn about the mission of the church, the mission of our lives and why we are still here. Uh, to better understand all of that, let's ask a few questions of the vision of heaven. First, let's ask who. Who did John see when he looked into heaven? 
Well, again, from the passage, John describes, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Uh, when we pause long enough from the busyness of life to, to think much about heaven, typically there are questions that come to mind, aren't there? Uh, what, what will heaven be like? What will we be doing in heaven? And who will be in heaven? Well, it's interesting as John describes what he's seeing, he describes heaven as an inclusive place. Heaven's not inclusive in the sense that everyone is going to be included because we know that's not the case. Uh, the Bible says that uh, there's no sin in heaven, that sinners don't have the ability to go to heaven. Our, our sin has separated us from God, and instead of heaven being our eternal destiny because of our sin and the wages of sin being death and the fact that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, hell is what awaits us unless and until we have heard the gospel and recognize that Jesus paid the price of our sin to take our sin away. Unless we have turned from our sin and turned to the Savior, we call that repentance. Unless we have, have trusted in Him, we call that faith. And the Bible says when you've done that, when you've repented of your sin, when you've turned to Christ, when you've trusted in Him, when you've called upon His name, you are forgiven, you're adopted into the Father's family, you're saved and heaven becomes your eternal home but we know that everyone is not accepted the good news about Jesus in fact we know that many have not even heard it but of those who have heard it still many have rejected it and so heaven is not inclusive in the sense that everyone is going to be there. Only those who have heard and believed the gospel will be there. But heaven is inclusive in the sense that, as John says, someone will be there. Someone from every nation. Someone from all the tribes and peoples and languages of the world. And yet that's not heaven as it is today. How do I know that? I know that because of the more than 11,000 people groups around the world, there are still 3,000 who have yet to be reached with the gospel. In fact, as far as we know, no one is even engaging them with the gospel. There's not a missionary there. There's not a strategy to reach them. And church, that's why we're still here. That's why church at the mill is still here not only are there people among the nations who have yet to hear you understand there's still people in our nation some of them are your neighbors and until the who of heaven are there we still have work to do i'm thankful for the ministries of church at the mill and reaching your neighbors and reaching the nations uh, I'm thankful for the impact uh, the church has had on my life and family. I enjoyed seeing uh, the Calverts being baptized this morning. It reminded me of my own family's experience. I'm grateful for a, for a couple of uh, Baptist laymen who were uh, out knocking on doors one night in a little town in the mountains inviting people to church. And, and at some point in the evening, they made their way up to a little rental house at 210 Province Street. It was up on the hill, the last house on the road before you turned up to the mountain and climbing the hill and climbing on the porch, they knocked on the door. There was a young man who answered the door, mid to late 20s. I don't know if they knew about his circumstances. I don't know if they knew that he was a single dad raising three little boys on his own, all three preschoolers at the time recently divorced but what I do know is that when they invited him to come to church my father accepted their invitation and that Sunday that came up next somehow he got three little rowdy boys ready and we attended church together 
we found a church family there that welcomed us and and so the next Sunday he took us back and the Sunday after that and it became the the pattern of of our lives and our family and what we found was a church family that not only welcomed us but that loved us that helped us to heal and well really helped raise us and I remember a few years after that uh, there was another knock at our door one evening and it was our pastor pastor Alan Herod who came at the invitation of my father because my older brother had questions about the gospel and what it would mean for him to give his life to Jesus he sat in the green chair in the corner of our living room shared the gospel with my older brother my younger brother and I we sat in the floor and we listened in and and Pastor Allen got three for one that night and like the four Calvert kids the three Chitwood boys were all baptized together just a few weeks later at the little First Baptist Church of Jellicoe Tennessee oh I'm so thankful for that church family and this church family knowing why you're here, knowing the work that you have to do, because until the who are there, we must remain on mission here. Well, let's ask another question of the vision this morning, and the next question we'll ask is more about where. Where, where are they? John describes uh, as he uh, looks into heaven, uh, not just heaven in a general sense, but specifically where people are standing at that moment in heaven he says after this i looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation all tribes and peoples and languages standing listen to this before the throne and before the lamb where are they in heaven They're standing in the very presence of god standing in the presence of the one who loved them and who died for them. The Lamb of glory slain before the foundations of the world. They're, they're, they're where God wants them to be because God desires them to be in his presence. They're, they're there enjoying his presence and worshiping him. The vision reminds us of what heaven is. It's that house that's not built with hands, the Bible describes. It's, it's a place where we will see as we are seen and we'll we'll know as we are known it's a place where we'll stand before our savior and our father jesus talked to his disciples about that place before uh, he was betrayed and crucified buried and risen from the dead you remember in john chapter 14 uh, jesus told his disciples uh, knowing that he would soon be crucified not uh, not to let their hearts be troubled you believe in god believe also in me he said in my father's house are many rooms and i'm going there to prepare a place for you i'm looking forward to being in the father's house aren't you not that i'm not thankful for my house here <laughs> by the way thank you church at the mill for building a house my wife Michelle and I, just before the pandemic, had the opportunity to see a house that you built. Uh, interesting uh, that you would choose to build it uh, where you chose to build it. And, uh, and the real estate slogan, location, 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 you failed. <laughs> uh, this is not the best location, at least not for property values, because you built a house in a refugee camp. What's interesting about that house is also who you build it for. Uh, there's a 16 year old boy who lives in that house and his four younger siblings. There's no mother that lives in that house, there's no father that lives in that house. It's remarkable that, that they live in that house. They, they're not from Uganda and the refugee camp where you built the house. By the way, it's not a it's not a terribly elaborate house. It's not like my house, probably not like your house. It's, it's a rather small house, uh, adequate, uh, uh, brick, two rooms, uh, tin roof, dirt floor, no plumbing, not available in a refugee camp, no electricity, that's not available either. 
but it's a tremendous upgrade for a child-headed household uh, for five orphans in a refugee camp. You missionaries learned of their experience. The, uh, the kids somehow made it out of South Sudan on foot without parents. Uh, if you're familiar with the conditions in South Sudan for years, war and genocide, uh, millions have, have been slaughtered and and presumably their parents, but they, they somehow made it out. Uh, they wandered into the refugee camp, and, and there your missionaries found out about them. And with the resources that this church generously provides in partnership with other churches across the country, as Pastor DJ referenced, you were able to build a house for those five kids. And to sure that their needs were met, there's food in the house, and and also to share with them about a father who loves them, who desires to adopt them, and will welcome them into his kingdom for all eternity. Until the who are there, we still have work to do here. The next question, the question is, how? How is it that you, you get there. We've made some reference to it already, but listen to the symbolism that John describes. After this I looked, and who? Behold, a great multitude that, that no one could number uh, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Where? Uh, they're in heaven, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And, and, and here's that symbolic phrase, clothed in white robes. That symbolizes salvation. The white robe symbolizes the cleansing. The Bible says that we're born dead in our trespasses and sin, that we're, we're stained by the guilt of our sin. But Jesus has come and paid the price of our sin. And so we sing about that fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Those who are in Christ have been forgiven. They've been saved. And the symbolism of the white robes is a symbolism of salvation that comes through Jesus. And when we share the gospel and the gospel is heard and believed, sin is washed away. But I want to tell you this morning about two individuals who I believe will be in heaven who have never even heard the gospel. You say, now that doesn't sound right. How do you go to heaven without hearing the gospel. Well, uh, let me tell you about these two individuals. Uh, the story actually begins with, with a training center that, that you helped fund for the International Mission Board in Nashville, Tennessee. It's a, a training center where deaf missionaries and missionaries to the deaf uh, get prepared to share the gospel around the world. There were some men who were there for training from Indonesia uh, during the pandemic, who weren't able to go back home when their training finished, but they wanted to, uh, to use what they had learned. And so they reached out uh, to some of their deaf friends in Indonesia, and they asked them to join them for an online meeting. We have something very important we'd like to share with you, they said. And, and a group of their deaf friends in Indonesia uh, got on a Zoom call with them. And, and, and these two individuals spent an hour sharing their testimony and the gospel with their deaf friends in Indonesia in sign language. And at the end of that call, two of those deaf friends put their trust in Jesus, prayed and asked God for forgiveness, and were saved. We're following up with them to ensure that, uh, that they have the opportunity to be baptized and, and that they're discipled in a local church. But, but that's how two individuals who have never heard the gospel because they can't hear but who have understood the gospel and believe the gospel will be saved. It's the how of salvation. And yet there are still millions of deaf around the world. Thank you for your ministry this morning to the deaf here in your community. Still millions who have yet to understand the gospel, who have yet to allow it to be communicated in a way that they can comprehend it, until the who are there, we're still here. Well, now we'll ask why, uh, the why of the vision. Why are they there? After this, I look, John says, and, and who? Behold, a, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all peoples and tribes and languages, where standing before the throne and before the Lamb, how they're clothed in white robes, the robes of salvation. 
And they have palm branches in their hands. Verse 10, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Why are they there? They're there for the same reason that you're here. They're there to worship. To worship the one who is worthy. To pay, pay honor to and, and, and to glorify the one who, who did for them what they could not do uh, for themselves. They're, they're there to sing the praises of the one who humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And the Bible says that he is the the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, and he's worthy of our worship. Uh, the scriptures say that he's the firstborn from among the dead, that in all things he might be first, that he might be preeminent. And he is worthy. He is worthy to hear his praises sang in every language he's placed upon the tongues of men. He's worthy to be honored and glorified by all the redeemed of every age. He is worthy of your worship. He is worthy of your living. He is worthy of your dying. He is worthy of everything. And until that vast multitude stands before him, his church still has work to do. Sharing the good news with your neighbors, sharing the good news among the nations. A final question. So what? Now, it's, it, it's not the so what that I might hear from my teenage daughter. That's not a question at all. <laughs> That's a statement. So what? No, no not, not that kind of so what. This kind of so what. So, so, so what does this mean for me? So what does the vision of heaven have to do with me? So what, God, do you want from me. Let me see if I can illustrate that for you uh, in a personal way. Uh, we had two birthdays in our family this week. My nine-year-old daughter turned nine on Monday. I turned 51 yesterday. I've got an arrangement with her, Pastor DJ, and it works like this. On her way to college, she can drop me off at the nursing home. Lily came into our family, actually not by uh, birth. My, my wife and I were foster parents in Kentucky uh, through our children's home, uh, Kentucky Baptist Homes for Children. And we'd had a teenage boy for about a year, and he got a different placement. They called and asked us if, if we would take a, a three-year-old little girl. We had raised three kids through three and I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I've done that three times. I, I don't know who came up with terrible twos. That's a misnomer. That thing doesn't, it doesn't kick in until three. I said, oh, no, no, no. She, 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 she's a, a great little girl, no behavior problems. I said, you're lying. She's three. And, <laughs> and, and yet when we saw her, <laughs> well, well, we took her. And, and they assured us it was a temporary placement just for a few months. And, and, and yet a year later, <laughs> when her mother's rights were terminated they asked us do you want to keep her and we said absolutely we do and we began a process of adopting and those of you who have fostered and adopted you know it's a, it's a, it can be a difficult process a long process the state system is so broken and and actually it was going well into the third year and we were about to move from our ministry in Kentucky to work with the IMB, which is headquartered in Richmond, Virginia. So I reached out to, to our social worker and I said, hey, we're going to be moving and we've been waiting on you to finish this adoption up, but just know that we'll come back and take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. And she said, well, no, actually you won't. Uh, you, at least you won't have Lily with you if you move. She's a ward of the state. She can't live out of the state. I said, well, that's a problem because I'm taking the job and, and, uh, God is calling us and we're moving, but we're not leaving her. <laughs> uh, we, we've got to wrap this thing up. She said, well, I'll do everything I can. And, and so I called her the next day. And I said, what have you done? <laughs> and I called her the day after that. I said, what'd you do today? 
And by day four, I'm sure she wanted to block my number, but nevertheless, she, she was doing all she can. It's just, again, it's a broken system and, 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 and very difficult to move the, the parts of it. And, and so I reached out to a supervisor and she said, I'll do all I can. And yet nothing was happening and the move date was coming. We're just a few weeks away. And, and, and then I called the governor's office. I said, I, we need some help here. We've been helping you at the time. We had a pro-life governor in the state of Kentucky, and, and we'd been helping him with some things that we agreed with him on. That wasn't everything, but a few things. And, and I reminded him of that, and I said, I need your help. And every night, we'd, we'd pray to the God of heaven, Lord, help us. You haven't given us her to leave her here, and yet you're calling us. And, and God, we need your help. And like literally two weeks before we moved, we stood in Judge Derwin Webb's courtroom and he pronounced Lily our daughter. Why do I share that with you? I share that with you because I think it helps you understand, so what would God have you do? You're kind of like the social worker, you see cabinet secretary, the governor, you, 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 we'd been left here because there's a father who wants to adopt. And he's done everything that needs to be done, but there's a system. And we have a part to play in helping that adoption process along by taking the good news of the gospel of Jesus and how adoption has been paid for by the very blood of Christ to the very ends of the earth. So the who can be there. And you and I will be able to look around someday as we stand before his throne and see those who God used us in some small way to bring there as his adopted sons and daughters. Oh, I'm looking forward to that day, aren't you? But it's not here yet. And yet we're still here. And we know why. Don't forget why you're here. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for reminding us today of what kindness you have shown us in sending your son to pay the price of our sin. I pray, Lord, that if there's someone here or joining online who is, who is yet uh, to be adopted as your son, your daughter, yet to put their trust in you, receive this gift, I pray, Lord, that, that right now at this very moment uh, you, would, you would convict them of, of, of their sin, convince them of the truth of the gospel, draw them to yourself, Lord, might they surrender and and joyfully receive your gift of salvation. And having done that, Lord, might you help us to understand why you don't just take us to heaven, but why we're here. And, and Lord, might you use us, not only here, but, but that the nations might hear the good news of the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church family, aren't you grateful for a man like this leading our missionaries? Thank you, Thank you. Mm. Mm. I, cr I cried through the whole thing. Uh, years ago, a man took the gospel to the country of China, and it changed a man's life. We couldn't think of a better way to end our service than by having Paul, an esteemed guest, commission and pray over a brand new member of our team as we're dismissed. To understand his story, take a look at the screen. Hello, I'm Zhang Yuehan. I'm born in China. I was born 20 years ago. A American brother led me to follow my brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. 之后，我的哥哥向我传扬福音。我经过一年多的灵与肉的挣扎之后，我也最终成为基督徒。之后，我在教会里面啊、呃、代职服侍啊、呃、十多年。在二零一七年的时候，神呼召我来全职服侍他。我之后去到肯塔基的神学院学习。现在
，我跟我的整个的家庭，一个妻子，四个孩子，来到这里，要来向这里的亚洲人传扬福音，成为我们这个教会大家庭的一个部分。Church family, we discovered there's not a single church in this ever-growing county targeting people that Pastor John and his family can reach in a way that we can't. And God orchestrated them to come and start a church right here on our campus that's beginning to meet weekly in another space. And as God continues to equip them, we couldn't be more happy to welcome this family into our journey together. Would you give them a hand? Amen. Pastor John and his wife Addie have a beautiful family. We want you to meet them. We want you to meet Paul. And so Paul's going to pray a prayer over John and his family, commissioning them and sending them, which is a high honor. And then after he prays, I'm going to give them about 30 seconds to go right up the center aisle to the hub. And if you'd like to meet with them. And as I listened to Paul preach this morning, I was reminded that there are some missionaries sitting in this room. You didn't come to church today believing you were a missionary, that God's begun a work in your life. And I promise you, if God calls you, Church at the Mill will send you. We'll do everything we can to get you wherever God is leading you to go. So, Paul, would you pray over this family and commission them? I'd be honored to. Let's pray together, church. Father, we thank you for Pastor John and for Addie, for these beautiful children. We thank you, Lord, for calling them out and raising them up, and for the work that、uh, you've set before them here in、uh, this part of South Carolina. And Lord, we know that、uh, that the peoples of East Asia that they are longing to see reached with the gospel. It's the most populous part of the world. Lord, so many of them have relocated and come here, even to South Carolina, into the communities in and around Church at the Mill. We pray, O、oh、God, that for those who are lost, that through Pastor John and Addie's ministry and through the ministry of Church at the Mill, that they would hear the gospel, that they would be saved, that they would be there around Your throne. Lord, we pray that You would bless this pastor and encourage him, and surround him with leaders and helpers. And We pray, Lord, that your church would flourish for the sake of the lost and for the sake of your glory among the nations. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Let's thank them again. I want to give them about 15 seconds to make their way out before you call. Let's stand together. Even as the Father has sent me, so I send you. God bless you. You are dismissed.